Hey everyone, it's Thomas here. So it's been a while since I made a video. Uh, today I'm going to introduce you to a speaker called Luna 177. Now the reason why it's called 177 is because the woofer is 177 millimeter, which is 6.5 inch. Uh, kind of creative. Uh, they also have this other speaker, the Luna 146, and that's a 5 inch woofer, 146 millimeter. All right, I thought it was cute. Um, so a while ago, Yuri reached out to me asking, Thomas, will you be interested in taking a look at our speakers? So this is an Italian company, uh, SS Quattro. I don't know how to pronounce it. It's, uh, it's an Italian probably, and uh, I don't speak Italian. I speak French, but not Italian. So uh, I took a look at the speaker and say, yeah, sure. Um, definitely would be, I will be interested in taking a look at your speaker. And for three reasons. Number one, uh, I like to help people out. Now in the past, manufacturer has to take an expensive ad in the magazine to promote their product. But these days, you know, with YouTube, anybody can do it. And it's good for the consumer because if there's more competition, if there's more choices out there, we only end up winning. So I figure, okay, sure. Uh, the second thing is that the speaker is actually quite expensive. So you're probably asking, Thomas, why would I be interested in hearing you talk about a speaker that costs seven to eight thousand dollars us on top of that a bookshelf speaker yeah fair enough i mean i would say a lot of people can afford that including me it's not a speaker that i can afford uh, so there's there are a few things uh, number one is that there's always something to learn playing with uh, different kind of uh, equipment so like all my videos i'll try to add something in that will make you think a little bit at the end of the video and the second is because um I always wanted to try a high-end bookshelf speaker at my place. It's one thing to hear it in a, in a show and another thing to try at home. And the last reason why I wanted to try it is because this one has tone control built into the speaker. So there's a switch at the back, one of the two switches that allow you to boost the treble or reduce the treble. A lot of speakers I try are too bright and I figure eh, with this I can adjust it and you know tune it to my liking. Of course, you'll be asking yourself, why won't I use an equalizer? Well, equalizer, yeah, you'll, you'll probably get face shift problems. It's probably not as transparent if you put it through a cheap equalizer, uh, for example. So there are many advantages of not using an equalizer and have the tone control built uh, directly in the crossover. So for these three reasons, uh, I, I was very curious about these speakers. All right, so Yuri lives uh, at Toronto. I live in Montreal, so that's about a six hour drive. So I asked my friend to go help pick it up for me. You know, it's a bookshelf speaker, so it shouldn't be no problem. Uh, what was very surprising is that it came in a wooden crate and it is massive. This is a very big bookshelf speaker. It weighs 16 kilogram. So it's like holding two, more than two ELAC B6.2 in your hand. I, I like that because I like heavy speakers. Yes, I know not all heavy speak, not all speakers are designed to be heavy, like the Harbeth, for example. Uh, but I, I just like equipment when they're very heavy. Of course, I was cursing when I was bringing it down to my basement. I mean, it is stupid heavy. And the box is so big that my friend could not pick up the speaker stands that came with it. So I had to use my, my cheap, thin speaker stand you know i really wish i got the speaker stand that came with it i'm sure it'll sound way better with it but uh, unfortunately it was just uh, too big and it, it didn't fit in my friend's car now if you look at the speaker so if you look at the the front it, there's a curve in the front i guess luna or well, lune in french means the moon it means moon right so i guess the design is to mimic uh a moon. Uh, so you have uh, this, the, the one that I got had nice uh, automotive uh, red paint on it and you have a uh, leather wrap on the side. To be honest, I'm, I'm not a big fan of leather myself. I like the paint so much that I'd rather see the whole thing in the red. Um, also to reduce cost because it is uh, quite an expensive speaker. Now we're looking at a speaker with a soft dome tweeter. I personally like soft dome tweeters and uh, well, it comes with a 6.5 inch paper cone, paper and carbon fiber cone. Um, they only start making it after they receive the order. 
uh, you need to put a deposit down and after that they'll start making it. Yeah, you can customize it. I mean, it's handmade after all. So how does it sound? So for those of you who have been following me, you know that I, I, I like to categorize my speakers. So you have the analytical, like the Focals and the Cavs. You have the musical speaker who is a bit rolled off on the treble, like the Harbef, uh, Sonus Faber. And then you have these uh, speakers with soft on Twitter that fall somewhere in the middle, like the Dying Audios. So they're, they're not overly bright, well they can be actually, um, but they're not also not too dark. And that's why I say silk dome tweeters usually appeal to like 90% of the people. That they're what I call the safe sound that everybody can be okay with. Uh, like cast and monitor audios, they, they can be a bit bright, so not everyone likes them and the hard baths or well, the higher end ones the sonus favor they can be a bit too dark so people fall asleep with them the dying audio is somewhere in the middle so when i fire up these speakers yeah it's a sound that i'm familiar with and i have to say um what i look for in a speaker fantastic highs great mid-range uh really powerful and low end like everyone right and I would say that these speakers, they do it very, very well. The top end is really refined and detailed. Uh, I would say almost like the Dying Audio Special 40. Now, I'll give the edge to the Dying Audio Special 40, but that's saying a lot because for me, the Dying Audio Special 40 has one of the best, best top end I've ever heard before. I say it's in the same ballpark so it's that good the mid-range you know out of all the speakers i've heard uh the harbeth 30.1 that the mid-range on that speaker I, I really really like it sure you don't have fantastic detail of the harbeth 30.1 the bass is yeah whatever but the mid-range is so good that i can just forget the highs and low and just live with it now, the mid-range, on the, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because for me, for the longest time, the, Har, the Harbef was like the standard for me. It's like the, the gold standard, the best mid-range possible that, that I, I like. However, I actually prefer the mid-range on these speakers because these, the mid-range on these speakers are very sweet, like, like honey. Okay, I know it sounds cheesy, oh my gosh, but out of all the speakers I try, in terms of sweetness, I think this is this is one of the one of the the most smoothest mid range I've ever heard. I personally prefer the mid range on these speakers over the Harbef. Now that's not saying that the Harbef is not as good as this. It's just that it's very very different. Well, not very. It's different, and I personally prefer the mid range on these uh, speaker because they're they're just so smooth and they sound very sweet. Uh, when it comes to bass, I think this is the uh, one of the bookshelf speaker team that can beat the the Bukhar S400, S300. Now in the past, uh, I, I say that those two speakers are one of the best when it comes to bass. I think this one is one level up. Now the, I, the reason why I keep saying I think is because I didn't have them side by side to compare. So based on my memory, I would say this um, speaker has the edge when it comes to bass. Now. It's not surprising, right? I mean, these speaker costs, what, three, four times the price of a Bukhar S400 and maybe six, seven times the price of a S300. So the expectation is very high. So regarding the tone control on these speakers, do they work? Yes, absolutely. Very subtle, but significant enough. And that's important because our rooms are all different. If you have a very lively room, so you might have this brightness issue. If your room has a lot of stuff in it and it's very dark, you might want to boost the treble a little bit. So let's say if you have a, an amp uh, that doesn't have a lot of power so that the low end doesn't really deliver, you, you might find your speakers a little bit bright. So in that case, you can just drop the treble. That actually reminds me, when I first got the speaker, um, my friend helped me brought it, bring it down to my basement, took it out, and I had it plugged to the uh, Prima Luna Dialog 1. Not a lot of power, but it sounded fantastic. So I can tell that the, the, the bass is a bit thin, but the top end was just beautiful. In fact, the friend who helped me bring it in, uh, he owns the Focal 
1008 bookshelf beryllium, the, the one with the beryllium tweeters, uh, bookshelf speaker. And you say that, whoa, these speakers play better than uh, my own speakers. In fact, he was interested in, uh, you know, getting a pair, well, if the price was right. But these speakers were almost, I think, maybe double the price of his uh, Focal speakers. So, yeah, okay, so it's not surprising that it was significantly better than his speaker. I have to say that we were both, when we first heard it, we were like, whoa. And eventually we changed it to a more powerful amp so that we got more uh, bass from it. So, in short, the speaker is my kind of speaker. It's my kind of sound because it sounds characteristic. It's very similar to my reference speaker, which is the Earthquake Titan Tigris. It has a lot of low end. It's a very warm speaker and it's really uh, sweet. Now, the problem with my Titan Tigris is that the bass is just out of control. I call it party speaker. And one day I'll talk about it. And these speakers have better control than my Titan Tigris. In, when, when it comes to the bass, but it doesn't have the same kind of power as my Titan Tigris. So, uh, like all speakers, uh, no speaker is perfect. Now, I got these speakers during the holidays, and uh, at the time, I didn't really have time to bring it to all my friends' place to try them. Now, for those of you who are new to my channel, what I like to do whenever I get something interesting is that I like to try at my friend's place with their equipment, with their environment, and some of them have very nice room. So it really gives me a different perspective on uh, the speakers or whatever equipment I want to try. Because sometimes something that don't sound good at my place sounds fantastic at my friend's place. So in this case, I invited uh, my friends over instead. So my friend with the Vin... Uh, who, so I have a few friends. Uh, one who owns... Uh, who's only playing with vintage gear. I have a friend who owns uh, the Focal Canter. So now we're talking about speaker that's seven, eight thousand US, right? So the expectation is very different compared to uh, reviewing uh, ELAC 6.2. Uh, it's not, you can't go like, oh, yeah, it's great for the money. No, no, no. It's great or it's not, period. So when my friends dropped by, uh, one thing they noticed is that, yeah, sure, it sounded great, but it lacks the high-end sound. So what is high-end sound? Uh, there's no such thing, right? If you Google it, what is high-end sound, there's no such thing. High-end sound is something that we, we define it ourselves by listening to many high-end system. And one of the criteria for us is that it has to be very refined on the top end and it has to have great control on the bottom end. Now, remember I say these speakers are very warm sounding. They're very strong on the low end, lots of bass. It's a double-edged sword. Too much bass, it becomes a party speaker, like my Titan Tigris, my reference speaker. So not enough bass and it'll sound thin and it'll sound, yeah, I'm missing power, right? So getting that fine line, a lot of bass, but not enough that it sounds like party speaker is actually difficult. No, we, we say um, high-end speaker, high-end sound has to have refined top end. One thing we notice is that the top end has direct relationship with the, the low end. If your low end is boomy and it's muddy, your speaker will not sound refined. If you don't have a lot of bass, your speaker will sound very detailed, very bright and very sharp. I remember once um, in the beginning of our audio journey, my friend sent me this video, this YouTube sound demo. And he said, wow, look at the clarity on these speakers, you know, I mean, our speakers can't do that. I look at the YouTube clip, I'm, I'm like, let me guess, you're listening this on your cell phone, right? I say, look, when there's no bass, the top end is gonna shine. It's gonna be crystal clear. <sighs> After that, he understood it. And whenever we look at speakers, we take in consideration the relationship. So sometimes when you find a speaker is not refined enough on the top end, instead of trying to boost the treble by using silver cables and so forth, the problem might actually be on the low end. Too much bass, too boomy, too close to the wall, or what not, right? So when my friends dropped by, they said, yes, it sounds very good, but it doesn't have that refinement that we find in top and uh, high-end speakers. Fortunately, we're very experienced in uh, setup. So, uh, yep, I, I completely agree with them. And uh, what I did, I, I changed the front end, like the way I would 
like the way I would set up my own Earthquake Titan Degress. So in this case, I brought out the Bell Canto, which is a Class D amp. And Class D, my specific Bell Canto, they're very lean sounding. So this is the part where we equipment matching is very, very important. And uh, we change cables. Well, for those of you who believe in cables. And that's when we notice, okay, now the bass is much more in control, more lean, and the top end starts coming out. It really shines. And at the end, when they left, they say, yeah, we will hear that high-end sound uh, that we only hear in high-end speakers. So equipment matching is very, very important. In fact, uh, recently, a friend of mine who hates Kev, he hates it. Too bright, too bright. Goes to audio show, walks in, walks out after three minutes. He dropped by my place because, as I said, we're very, we have experience in equipment matching. Sat down and said that, you know what? I would take these Kef LS50 home because they sound fantastic. You know, I've been listening to Kef for, uh, for, uh, for a while, you know, in shows and stores, and I never liked them. But this, I would take it home, but with your front end setup, your whole complete front end setup. So equipment matching is very important. And I guess the lesson here is that when you find that your top end is not as good, sometimes it's because it's the, the bottom base part that, that, that is the problem. So maybe you need a, an amplifier that's more lean and more tight uh, to fix the problem. Okay, fine. And the other thing about uh, when your bass is a bit fat, instrument separation is not that clear. I noticed that when I had my Totem Signature 1. You see, that speaker uses this uh, metal bass dome to it, very sharp. There's not a lot of bass on that Totem Signature 1. But maybe because of that, the top end is razor sharp. In fact, you can literally take a pencil and draw around the people, like the, the performers. It is that sharp that the instrument separation is incredible. This speaker, the instrument separation, you really need to use a preamp that's very good at instrument separation. Either that, or you need a lot of distance between them. In fact, we had to take a ruler out to measure it. I brought it over to my friend's place who, uh, who has the 989. Because that's one thing he noticed. How come the instrument separation is not that good? It, soundstage is wide, very wide. Speaker sounds big. It's a, it has big sound, but it seems that everybody is just jammed in the middle. So I told him, well, at my place, I'm using the bell canto, so it, the sound is more lean, right? So when sound is more lean, the top end is more clear. He's using the Hegel H300. And also I have a, a tube preamplifier, which is very good at uh, creating that holographicness. So at his place, uh, what we needed to do was to separate the speakers about, I think, 10 feet apart. And then you start, then the magic happens. Okay, things are uh, spread out uh, way better. I think that this is very important because a lot of times when we bring a speaker home, we might end up putting it at the same place that we usually put our other speakers. Like when, when, when he has a design that is a bit weird, maybe try with different placement. In this case, the tweeter is offset to one side. It's not centered. So maybe it, it does something to the instrument separation. So like the, the Bukhar S400, it's not a traditional design. So you might want to play with speaker placement to get the best out of it. Maybe you need more distance between both. Maybe you need to sit forward, backward, you play around with it. Because sometimes I hear people say, oh, this speaker doesn't have good instrument separation. Well, I find that it's okay. It could be because of your speaker placement, especially non-traditional design speakers. When, when I brought it over to my friend who owns the Quad 989, because it's a treated room, we have the space and we're able to push the volume. Uh, at one point, I uncontrolling told myself, it's like, wow, these speakers are incredible. All right, so I'm gonna end the video at this point. Um, one thing I want to talk about though, okay, and, and I'm going to tie it all together, don't worry about it, okay, is that it's all about the music. I hear this all the time. For me, I'm like, really, is it? You're on Thomas and Stereo, you're not on Thomas and Music. I think equipment 
is as important as music. You see, my wife is all about the music. When she listens to music, you know what? She turns on the TV and play music through the, uh, the TV speakers. Never once she said, you know, can you put some better speakers? No, for her, it's all about the music. In fact, she laughs at me from time to time when we talk about music. I remember once uh, she overheard us, me and my friends talking about holographicness, the air, and that's why she always make fun, of, make fun of me. Oh, you guys listen to air holographicness. Come on, what is wrong with you guys? Listen to the music. Yeah. So that's why for me, she's all about the music. People like us is about the music and also about the equipment. And being branded uh, an audiophile, one of the bad things is that sometimes people think that all we listen to is the equipment. And I would say that it is true to some extent. You know, at the beginning of my audio journey, uh, all I listen to is uh, audiophile recordings. I try to find CDs that are that sounded great on my speaker. It doesn't matter if I like the music or not, I wanted my system to sound great. But I think like all honeymoon, it comes to an end. At one point, we go back to the music. So one of the problem that I have as somebody who listens to, let's say, Chinese music, uh, is that I can't find them on CDs. So I end up listening to these music on uh, YouTube and it's completely fine. Now, the problem with music on YouTube sometimes is that they can sound a little bit thin. Well, you know, when you listen to MP3, 128K, it's sometimes lacking in the bass. So that's why I like my system to be warm sounding, bass heavy, because when I listen to YouTube, they sound good. In fact, with these speakers, the Luna 177, I find myself spending half my time listening to YouTube uh, sound clips. I mean, sound vi music videos, excuse me. You know, there's a lot of songs on YouTube that, are, that sound good on uh, these speakers. And... Um, and I think that that's uh, something that we don't think about when we buy speakers, right? Would it sound good with YouTube? Would it sound good with Spotify? Does it sound good with Tidal? Or it only sounds good with, uh, you know, high-res SACDs or XRCDs? So, uh, yeah, something to think about. Um, if you find that when you listen to YouTube, it sounds horrible, maybe try adding a subwoofer, you know, increase that bass. Um, when I dropped by my friend's place who owned that uh, $300,000 system, I actually made him play YouTube clips. He was like, oh man, it's not gonna sound good, you know? But it sounded great because there's a lot of power on the low end, right? A lot of bass. Uh, so uh, that's one thing I noticed uh, playing with these uh, speakers. Do I recommend the speaker? I say that if you have the same uh, three main criteria as uh, me, fantastic top end, very refined top end, uh, sweet mid-range and very powerful bass, then this is a speaker you can look into. Now, the problem is, of course, it's not like me recommending a Bukhar S300, S400, Elac 6.2. S300, you buy it, you don't like it, return it. No, no risk. Elac 6.2, buy it, don't like it, well, you might lose 300 bucks or you might even can return it on Amazon. We're talking about seven thousand, eight thousand dollars now. So I would say because they have, uh, they go to audio shows around the world, and uh, I'll link them in the description box. Uh, for example, if you're in Toronto and you go to the audio show, and uh, you know you're looking for this kind of speaker, this specific sound characteristic, then you know what? Look for Yuri at uh, at the audio show. Bring your own recording play it and see maybe uh, this is a speaker for you of course uh, i'm well aware that at seven eight thousand us there are many options out there but despite that i would say if you ever get a chance to go to an audio show and you know that this speaker is uh, on display there bring a recording make an effort and go check it out um, it might be the speaker that you're looking for so until next time guys see you later